university areas. And I think that's precisely the point that I was trying to make and we very much understand the dilemma and we understand um, the needs of, of those countries. But there is now a new paradigm that is being more explicit in Rio Plus 20. We understand the needs of growth, the needs for development, but we also understand that there, there are impacts and we don't want to, certainly don't want to commit the same mistakes we, we did in the past. But we want to make sure that uh, we look at the landscape and we have the means to, to see which areas are most relevant for, for conservation, which areas are more appropriate for um, development, for agriculture and for other activities. So many of the tools that we develop um, in the science department of my organization is precisely looking at those dilemmas. There will be areas that are just so incredibly important for conservation, not only because of biodiversity, which is incredibly high, but also because of the provision of the services that are you know, um, um, needed by a number of people. So looking at each case will be a different case, but there is a way to look and to find out what are the trade-offs be between you know, conservation and development that also um, takes the inputs of, of the, the local people that is done in a participatory way. So we don't really think that, um, as I mentioned in the past, I think the focus was very much on biodiversity conservation. We now look into our you know, mission with a much broader um, uh, um, approach that we understand that there is need for development and, and needs for conservation. I think the balance is into looking into what's most appropriate and what it will cause less impact. If I may just add a, a couple of things to what uh, is already said. I thought there, is a, 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 there are two new dimensions to that. That the uh, world, uh, I mean globally, world around, wherever one looks at, uh, the communities which are living in the good forests are the poorest of the lot. You take it globally, you take it within a country like India, uh, majority of India's most poor actually are living in the forested area. So the issue, as she already said, that there is some mistake about over, uh, I mean, a blanket um, pro protection or, or uh, uh, support to conservation was perhaps wrong. What was all very critically missed out in that policy is the whole issue of entitlement. That people who live in forest area poor, not, not just because there was no development, but they were actually, they didn't have any entitlement to their right to livelihood. So that uh, I would like to submit two things. One thing is that one has to recognize the forest uh, communities' right to livelihood, which is their entitlement. And number two is there has to be a global framework which is now emerging slowly, though, uh, at uh, uh, perhaps at national and then global level, to provide compensation for those people who have conserved the forest. In other words, they have uh, they, they have lost the opportunity for development and they should be compensated for. So they should be compensated for by the global community, they should be compensated for if it's a larger country with huge inequalities and uh, various um, uh, economic opportunities available like India. Those communities should also be compensated by the other rest of the population within the country. So there are compensatory mechanisms which have to be established and to be able to, to establish those mechanisms, one has to prima facie uh, agree to the framework of entitlement. So that's number one. Once that happens, the balance is worse. So that will pave way to then uh, create specific policy instruments to then balance the conservation and the uh, the other land use uh, mm, options for the community. Thank you. Uh, may I have two more questions if there are any? 
then we will complete. Yes, ma'am, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Duygu Kutlay. I come from Tema Foundation in Turkey. And thank you very much for the informative uh, session. I would like to ask two questions. One to Professor Shah. Uh, she mentioned uh, that we should go beyond profit. And I would like to ask, uh, from the perspective of an economist, do you find it realistic for private sector to move beyond profit and if so, what would be their motivations uh, and why should they move? And uh, the other question is uh, to all of you, uh, um, and this is a very mm, common question nowadays, but do you think from economical perspective that organic farming or back to basic uh, farming as in Punjab can feed us all? Uh, do you think that's the future? Thank you very much. Thank you. Before getting the answers, let's have the last uh, question as well from the gentleman. Voy a hablar en español, así que por favor, sorry. Pues aquí se habla de Guillermo Rodríguez de la Fundación Procedura Nueva de Santa Marta en Colombia. Aquí estamos, a, o, o, pues, venía con la expectativa de hoy cuál era la interrelación y cuál era el rol que jugaba el sector privado. Es decir, nosotros en nuestro país tenemos efectivamente unas zonas bananeras, unas zonas de palma africana que están, tra, eh, que son, pertenecen realmente al, al sector privado y pues sí se juega un rol del sector privado en el manejo de esos territorios y pues de pronto eso está afectando la seguridad alimentaria a nivel de comunidades pero pues yo no veo eh, cómo ustedes están viendo esa parte del de sector privado eh, jugando un rol en ese equilibrio que debe tenerse entre los ecosistemas y la seguridad alimentaria I think we can also combine this question with the first one. Um, Professor Shah, would you like to start? Thank you very much for the very expected and otherwise relevant question. Uh, yes, the private sector has no incentive if there are no profits. Uh, my uh, straightforward answer to your question is um, that when it comes to food security, this is almost next to the existence of human, uh, human being, uh, it cannot be left to private sector. Private sector actually does not have a, a, any, uh, an, a, a, any uh, prior, priority role to play. It, that's where the framework of political economy comes, or the entire literature on food security is around the entitlement, it's around the state's role. So the state cannot, the state at every level cannot, including the global governance, cannot give up the, uh, the responsibility of feeding the population. So if it is a question of only providing the basic minimum required food to uh, the entire population at any scale, it has to be pri primarily the role of the state which has been uh, historically established in the, in the literature. But otherwise, if you ask me, that is my stance. So I'm actually, you would uh, be much, uh, much better for, uh, uh, would prefer to use the political economy framework where state cannot withdraw in certain cases and food is one of them, is, is the, is it. Then, linking that with the role of private sector, that doesn't mean that if the state takes the responsibilities, the state has to do everything itself. It has to regulate, it, it has to uh, give direction, and it has to, uh, uh, to facilitate. So the private sector can be facilitated by the state to do certain things under certain situation. For example, organic farming, 
uh, the state is committed to, if the state is committed to do that under, uh, or promote that under certain uh, situation, it can invite private sector, it can do it in a in public-private partnership to match the complementarity of the two sectors. The state comes with the basic political commitment and the basic investment uh, priorities uh, facilitation and the private sector comes with the technology and the management skill and the ability to see some commercial uh, interests which then therefore can be taken off on another scale. So these are the, the context or these are the uh, this is a framework within which private sector can play useful uh, role without uh, losing the profit. But if they come only with the profit motive, food security is not their bargain. That is the responsibility of the state. Just one or two sentences. Just a simple point about uh, the organic farming yeah. or um, our traditional way of farming. Point to you, we should not reach that state that, that we would have no choice but to go into organic farm. Let us not reach that point. Slowly and steadily, we can start shifting <coughs> and start our dependence on fertilizer and pesticides and over the poor drink of water. So that you know if there is no water tomorrow, there will be no agriculture, organic or non is in order. So for the tipping point tops and the changes are not linear. They are you know, they could be anywhere like uh, they could be at the trip or not we know that we may fall tomorrow. So uh, we have to be very careful and all studies have shown that traditional basic farming, organic farming does not give it gives almost same returns as this intensive the farm. And it is only the two, three years of transition that output may fall. But <coughs> long run, it is all gain. Today what is happening for short term gain, we are, you know, there is a long term pay. If you want long term gain, we have to have some short term gain, pay. In terms of reduced output, which is also very not uh, empirically verified. Thank that you. is how we have to focus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Unfortunately, I have to close the workshop first. I would like to thank to all our panelists and all of you for being with us. Um, if you have more questions, of course, our panelists uh, might be available uh, outside, so you could discuss more. And for those who stayed uh, with us, we have some uh, samples of uh, our uh, working papers uh, that that is on economics of ecosystem services, you may uh, you may take them. We, we didn't bring much, but uh, they are all available online as well through uh, UNEP's webpage under ecosystem management. Thanks for being with us. Thank you.
to be closed to the meeting. So, could I have a show of hands if you would like the meeting closed to the meeting? Okay, well, if, if, if the media comes in, I'll ask them to leave. Thank you. Uh, we started a bit late, uh, but that wasn't our fault. Uh, so, just, uh, there's been a lot of correspondence and communication. Oh, okay. Uh, Larissa. Could you ask a technical person if there's a PowerPoint somewhere around here? Because I've only got about you know, my laptop is running out of power. Uh, so. Did you say that No, I. I uh, anyway, let me continue. So we've had uh, uh, numerous informal and formal uh, communications about this. Uh, just to give you the background. There were two motions originally submitted. Motion 59, about the Great Barrier Reef. Motion, motion 123, related to mining and gas. The, res the resolution committee uh, had been asked to uh, 
bring together merge resolutions where there was considered to be a lot of overlap. Um, because Motion 123 made reference yeah, to the Great Barrier Reef, someone thought that was yeah. sufficient reason Why? to merge the. the we have to. But it wasn't done for any in. other. There was no it's other agenda. Yeah. There was no nefarious intent uh, behind the merger. Uh, the sponsors of both mergers wrote to the. Uh, um, wrote, wrote in, requesting that they be separated and. and um, so the, the first thing I'm going to do shortly is call upon the sponsor to confirm that. In which case, we will then discuss the two original motions in sequence, starting with the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the, uh, as, uh, there's been a lot of, since the original Great Barrier Reef mo motion was sent in, there's been a lot of activity, because this motion is to do with uh, the, its World Heritage status, and emerging problems, which have been subject to um, uh, World Heritage Bureau investigations and responses from the Australian government. Uh, and I understand that the sponsors of the of Motion 59 have updated their motion to take into account